Zechariah chapter 8. So, chapter 8 is about positive motivation. So, there are quite a number of pointers in the outline. Can we close the door? This is a secret gathering. (laughs) Okay, thank you. But, for the first eight verses, I just want to break it down this way so that you you, you see in, uh, it is in line with uh, the positive motivation that God wants to encourage them. So where is it? Here, City of Truth. In fact, I think I preached this. Uh, I preached this in church. Or not this church. Um, very simple. Verse 1 to verse 2 the zeal of his love, the passion, the enthusiasm, the zeal of his love. Verse 3 to 6, we have the results of his return. And then 7 and 8, we have the gathering of his people. At the end of the day, he still wants all his people back. So, verse 1. Again, the word of God of no the word of the Lord of hosts came, say, thus says the Lord of hosts. Reminding us once again this is divine revelation. And what did he remind them? I am zealous for Zion with great zeal. I am zealous for Zion. If you look into your center margin. It is jealous. Jealous. What is jealousy? What is mine and I treasure it. But if you take it away, I am jealous. I am jealous for Zion with great zeal. Same thing. I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy. God loves Israel so much. (coughs) And he does not wish to share them with anyone. This is as simple as I can put it. God loves Israel so much that he is not willing to share them with anyone. When he gave the instruction to Hosea, go marry a prostitute and so on, it's not that it is God's will. Not that God's desire is in that direction. It's just that he wanted to show them because without a parable, without a story, without illustration, people may not get the message. So he went to the extreme to tell Jose, go marry a prostitute. Yeah? And, be unfa- and, 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 and the prostitute is so unfaithful. Then, what are you telling us God? You are the one. You are unfaithful to me. Okay? Despite Jose loving his wife, she was still unfaithful. And that was a picture of the people of Israel. Still, regardless, God loves them and does not want to share them with anyone. With great fervor, with great fervor, I am zealous for her. If someone comes to you, uh, goes down on his knees and they say, I'm jealous for you. I'm jealous with great fervor. I'm jealous for you. You marry him immediately, right? (laughs) I mean, there is so much uh, sincerity in in, in this word, in verse 2. God is really, really treasuring these people, Israel. And if it is good news for Israel, it means it is going to be what? Bad news for the enemies of God. We will see more soon. So that is the zeal of his love. 
now the results of his return and here we will see full restoration full not in part verse 3 thus says the lord i will return to zion this is talking about a future event and the word will that means it is promise and it will come to pass and this points to the second coming of jesus christ i will return to zion and dwell in the midst of jerusalem jerusalem shall be called the city of truth the mountain of the lord of hosts the holy mountain and you see i will return that means first i must have come first right i must have come then i can return so this verse this line here as i mentioned earlier points to the second coming some people think it's the first coming no 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 it's the second coming because he must come first then he can return now all together there are about 13 things i want to point to you as we go through this chapter so the first thing god is saying i will return to zion first promise and dwell in the midst of jerusalem and by then jerusalem will become the political and the religious capital of the world we all know that right yes. from isaiah chapter 2 and, and and so on other places it will become the capital of the world the millennial kingdom jerusalem shall be called the city of truth is it currently is it currently no it is not but in the future it will be the city of truth and jesus is the truth yeah it is his city so we can look at a few verses let's look at psalm 31 verse 5 Psalm 31 verse 5 In Psalm 31 The Lord a fortress in adversity So in verse 5 Into your hand I commit my spirit You have redeemed me O Lord God of truth And this When Jesus hung on the cross And at his last breath Into your hand I commit my spirit But this I want to point to you, you have redeemed me. Who have redeemed Jesus? O Lord God of truth. And in the last days, God, who will be in the person of Jesus, residing and residing in Jerusalem, He is the truth. You follow me? So it is the city of truth because He is truth, God of truth. And Jerusalem will be the city of truth also mentioned here the mountain of the lord of hosts the mountain of the lord of hosts this uh, nobody can miss all the other all when we come to zechariah uh, 13 Je zechariah 14 especially you find that there'll be a fog line there'll be earthquake the north Mount Olive break into half, half to the north, half to the south. Everywhere around will be level to plain. Level. But Jerusalem will be raised on elevation. That everywhere you see, hey, this is the mountain. You follow me? It's not like, hey, where Jerusalem are hidden within some valley. No. It will be conspicuous. The mountain of the Lord of hosts. We look at one more Zephaniah. Zephaniah 3:13. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteous things, and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down. 
and no one shall make them afraid. So, at that point in time, there will be Jerusalem on a mountain. And then the, it is the city of truth. And Jesus dwells there. And He is the truth. So how do you think the people will be behaving? Lying? <laughs> Untruthful? Yeah. No! At that point in time, the remnant, not, not everyone, remnant, you know, everywhere, all generations, the remnant, these are the faithful to God. At that point in time, the remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies. Well, that tells me uh, the Jews have been lying. <laughs> in future, no more lying. Nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Now they are always on alert. They know if the battle siren goes off, they will go into tunnels and dungeons and go into their homes. So we move on. Verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts. So wait, I show you. First thing, he will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Second thing is, it will be Jerusalem will be known as a city of truth. There are 13 things that I want to show to you. The promises and the promises of God. The first promise is uh, he will return. That's not good enough. He will stay, he will dwell. That is the first promise. So some people say, I will return, but then I can go again. But Jesus first promised, I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Number two, it will be the city of truth. Number three, it will be the holy mountain. Holy mountain. What is number four? Thus says the Lord of hosts, number four is, All men and all women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand. And this speaks of what? Peace. They shall be safe again. They can just enjoy their golden years with undisturbed tranquility. No anxiety. No need to run for bomb shelters. They can just, you know, old men and old women. Now Singapore is a very blessed place. And we yes. can walk the streets. If you got kids, daughters even, you can walk the streets and, and come back late or whatever. Or your granddaddy and mommy can just sit in the park and don't get mocked. You try in some places in US, after dark, don't go. Some places like the Bronx, don't go. They mock you. Sometimes in deep broad daylight, they will also mock you. In fact, U.S. Uh, has been experiencing a lot of shootings uh, in the last few years. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you think hard. Huh, do you want to migrate to U.S.? <laughs> anyway, the Hong Kongers are coming here. <laughs> so my Cantonese shall improve. So, the fourth promise, all men and all women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, and so on. Because of great age. Longevity. <laughs> Longevity. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, verse 5. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. These are again the helpless and the dependent people. Boys and girls. They are innocent. They know nothing. They just want to enjoy their childhood. But today, look away from Israel. You just look at Syria, you look at Damascus, you look at uh, Iraq and so on. You look at the torn down places, bomb out places, and look at little kids. They, they, there is no joy in their life. They, they are just like refugees. And in Israel, uh, young kids and so on, they are trained about all this uh, preparedness for, for war. And then when you travel in the public transport, you find those soldiers, young soldiers, uh, young girls and boys, uh, they are carrying rifles now. Right? Rifles! 
waste their childhood. Ours can go this mall, go Ion, go shopping, go everywhere. <laughs> but it shall be, that's the fifth promise. The, fifth, the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls. It is paradise. It is paradise. So at that point in time, Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. Question I want to ask you, where is the church? Will you and I be there? Will you and I be there? No, we won't. Okay, good. I'm glad you'll be attending class. And this is for Israel and for those who are saved after the rapture. For us, we will be raptured, we'll be taken up to be with Christ, have the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we'll be in the new Jerusalem up there. We will come back with Him in the second coming, but we will not be staying here. We will be up there. They, this will be here. Okay. But to commute is not a problem because you can walk through walls and you can just <laughs> appear here. Really, distance will never be a problem. Okay, so this is Jerusalem, the capital of the world. So verse 6, thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, will it also be marvelous in my eyes, says the Lord of hosts. What God is saying is, for the remnant, those faithful to the Lord, if today you see anything marvelous, you see anything good, I tell you, in the future it will be better. Mm -hmm. That's what God is saying. If it is marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of these people in these days, today, today, while you are here, I'm going to return the rain to you, the, the land will bear fruits and, and so on. This, these are earthly blessings, you follow me? But God is saying this is only a sampling. In the future, it will be better. Will it also be marvelous in my eyes? Because God is seeing what? He is seeing the future, which you and I cannot see. But He tells us in advance in the form of prophecy. And it can only be possible because you know why? He is sovereign. All things are possible with God. So will it also be marvelous in my eyes? Yes, of course. Says the Lord of hosts. Verse 7. Now we come to the gathering of His people. Verse 7 and 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts. And here we have the sixth promise. Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. Hey, what happened to the north and the south? Why no north and south? I will save my people from the land of the east. And where is the east? The rising sun. Ah. And where is the west? The setting sun. So, in the language there, it means the entire world. Yes. But you might also wonder, hey, how come he missed out the north and the south? But if you look at Zechariah chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, he already sent the black horse and the white horse to the north to put the enemy down. And then he has also taken care of the south by sending the the Dekel horse to the south, and that's Egypt. And during that time, their comprehension of the world is north, south, east, and west of Jerusalem. So north, you know, the, the Babylonians, the, the Persians, the, the, the Syrians, taken care of. But in the future, these are the Russians, the Gog and the Magog. And then those in the south, Egypt, the world. So all taken care of. North, south, and then the east and the west. So God is saying, I will save my people from the land of the entire world. And that is the sixth promise. I will save my people. Verse 8, I will bring them back. 
I will bring them back. That is the seventh promise. I will bring them back. So, while save them from the hands of their enemies, God wants to bring His people back to Jerusalem, back to Israel. Oh, Israel so big, man. Israel so big. Huh? It is very big. It is very big. When God promised Abraham, from up there, Euphrates, all the way down there to the Nile, and so on, I think in Genesis chapter 15, that whole area sits on about 300,000 square miles. Today, they're only occupying 10%, about 30,000 square miles. So when God said, I will bring them back, uh, you've got space. Maybe tell the Hong Kongers to go there first. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is the seventh promise. I will bring them back from exile that is present because those people are still up in the north, right? Exile from tribulation, from persecution that is in the future. So near fulfillment from the exile, God said, I'll bring them back. And then in the far future, during tribulation, the Antichrist will be persecuting the the the. the chosen people, the Israelites, and also those who turn to Christ, the Christians. But God said, I will bring them back. And they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. You know what are all this? These are all covenant language. God is not deviating. This is the covenant I have made with Abraham. Through you, the world will be blessed. And this is something that God keeps. So He wants to bring them back. And He said, I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. No longer, you see, no longer mention about eh, uh, rituals and, and, and all the things that they go through. Nothing to do with rituals anymore. Now it's just purely you are my God in truth and in righteousness and we are to worship God one in truth right and in spirit yes so it is relationship no more ritual so we look at Ezekiel Ezekiel 37 verse 23 Ezekiel 27 verse 23 they shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Future. Okay, one more. Verse 27. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Remember in Ezekiel we studied the building of the tabernacle? My tabernacle shall also be with them. Indeed, I will be their God and they shall be my people. It is emphasized over and over again. God will not divorce them. God will always bring them back. And okay, since we are talking about them, let's talk about us in Venezuela. Okay, first Peter chapter 2 verse 9 in case you say hey God forgot about us don't even worry about Israel but us the church 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 but you are a chosen generation the Jews are chosen people we are a chosen generation because not all the Gentiles chosen generation a royal priesthood we are all priests not just Levite, any Levites around we are all the Lim, the Tan the, 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 <laughs> all you know. we are all priests a holy nation his own special people 
that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people. We once were not. We once uh, were of the world in darkness. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy in the past, but now have obtained mercy. Praise the Lord. And God includes us in His grand plan. So, we move on. Verse 9. Man must also do his part. God will do his part, but man must do his part. God can provide the salvation. He sent His Son Jesus to the cross to take our place for our sins. But we must do our part. Doesn't mean automatically I was born into a Christian home. So I become Christian. So we must do our part. So what is their responsibility? Verse 9. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong. You who have been hearing in these days, these words by the mouth of the prophets, who spoke the, in the day the foundation was laid, for the house of the Lord of hosts, that the temple might be built. So what is God saying? You who have been hearing, talking to who? Talking to those people who have been listening to the word. And this came by the mouth of the prophets. So, in that period, in that period, who were they listening to? Who were they hearing? Haggai and Zechariah. These were the two who told them, go and build the temple. Haggai is the practical one. Zechariah is the visionary, the spiritual one. But both had the same message. Go back to building the temple. So you have heard, right? But hearing, hearing must be translated to action. So doctrine must convert, must translate to deeds. Oh yeah, Zechariah, you said the good thing. Wow, Haggai, wow, her bang, really good. I like what you say. But then they go back to their panel houses. They haven't done anything. But we read in Haggai chapter 2, they went to build. Haggai chapter 2, verse 3 onwards, I think. Haggai, Haggai. So, in Haggai chapter 2, chapter 1, he scolded them. So, chapter 2, who is left among you who saw this temple in the former glory and how do you see it now, comparison? So, when you go all the way down to verse, where is it? Verse 9. Chapter 2, okay, verse 14, Haggai, no, this is uh, Haggai chapter 1, sorry, sorry, Haggai chapter 1, I, I, gave, I gave wrong, Haggai chapter 1, verse 14, and the last part, of all the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Before this, they were listening. And then, after listening, they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. So, the same thing. Let your hands be strong. We turn back to Zechariah chapter 8, verse 9. Are you all with me so far? Let your hands be strong. Get busy. You have heard the words of the prophet now go and work who spoke on the in the day the foundation was laid the day the foundation was laid who were there Haggai 
Zechariah, they were speaking. So, we now go to verse 10 and we are looking at the 8th promise. For before these days, there were no wages for men, nor any hire for beasts. There was no peace from the enemy for whoever went out or came in. <clears throat> for I set all men, everyone, against his neighbor. Verse 10, the eighth promise is there will be employment. There will be employment. Because those days, before those days, there were no wages for men. That means no employment. It does not mean you work and I don't pay you. But there was no work. They just didn't want to work. They went to attend to their own homes, but they're not building the Lord's house. So, God is saying in the reverse is, in the future, there will be employment. You will be busy. Nor any hire for beasts. There was no peace from the enemy for whoever went out or came in. And God promised to, to such a disobedient people in Isaiah 57 verse 21. And he repeated it a few times. There is no peace for the wicked. There is no peace for the wicked. That's why they were always besieged by enemies. Because they had been wicked in the eyes of God. But in the future, there will be employment, there will be peace. For I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. So even amongst them, they have no peace, they were fighting. But the eighth promise says that there will be employment. Verse 11. But now, I will not treat the remnant of these people as in the former days, says the Lord of hosts. So is this not positive motivation? How did he treat the people in the past? He wrote on them, he disciplined them, he sent them into exile. But now he's saying positively, but now I will not treat the remnant of these people as in the former days. So you look at the promises. Now the ninth promise, he is promising them agricultural prosperity. Agricultural prosperity. For the seed shall be prosperous. The vine shall give its fruit. The ground shall give her increase. And the heavens shall give their due. I will cause the remnant of these people to possess all this. Wow. I can think of durians. A lot of durians. <laughs> a lot of rambutans. A lot of grapes. For the seed. You ask any farmer, what does he want for the next season? Seed. No seed, no harvest. Nothing. No future. For the seed shall be prosperous. And you look at Leviticus 26 verse 4. Then I will give you rain in its season. This is talking about chapter 26 is about the promise of blessings and retribution. So Leviticus 26 verse 4. Then I will give you rain in its season. So before that, no, because punishment. But then later on, I will give. So it is grace. Nothing you can do. You can go and sow seeds in the heaven, try and make rain. But it is God who gives. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. It tells us that our dependence is still upon God. But of course, scientists think differently. They think in the lab, 
they can do genetically modified food. They can make water for you, can make cake, can make egg. China can make egg. You know, can make so many things. Can, re can almost reproduce and make a clone of a, a human and an animal. But our provisions are from the Lord. We still depend on Him for the rain, the water, the harvest, the produce. And you see the agricultural prosperity. The seed shall be prosperous. The vine shall give its fruit. You can plant so much. But God sent the locust. It's gone. The ground shall give, it, give its increase and the heavens shall give their due, which is important. They need the rain. And I will cause the remnant of these people to possess all this. Right now, the remnant of his people do not possess all this. But the wicked in this world seem to be possessing all the riches. But it's okay. The day will come when you'll be transferred to the righteous. Amen. And it shall come to pass that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel. So he's talking to the whole Israel, north and south. You were a curse, right? So I will save you and you shall be a blessing. So from a curse to becoming a blessing, all by God's sovereign power, I will save you. That is security. So, the tenth promise is, you shall be a blessing. So do not fear. Let your hands be strong. And he's, God said, you shall be a blessing. It is the fulfillment of this that he made to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. If you look at verse 2, I will make you, this is God promising Abraham. You remember this, right? Genesis 12. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. You shall be a blessing. Just as we just read in Zechariah 8.13, You shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So, whatever was promised will eventually come to pass, though not yet. So, back to Zechariah 8. So that is the 10th promise, you shall be a blessing. And that day shall come when they will all be priests, like us. They all shall be like evangelists, yeah, sharing the word of God. And they will be witnessing to the Gentile nations during the millennium. Oh, no, even during the Great Tribulation. For thus says the Lord of hosts, just as I determined to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, says the Lord of hosts, and I would not relent. So what God is saying, in the past, I promised to punish you, and I did. And even though, even though uh, it was quite severe and then you all are suffering, God said, I would not relent. Because you spare the rod, you spoil the child. So they had to go through a period of discipline. Because your fathers provoked me to wrath. So what God is saying, that day when I promised to punish you, I did. Now, I promise to bless you. I will. You see that argument? Because earlier he said, I, you shall, I will save you, you shall be a blessing. Then you said, turn the mark. Real or not? So God said in verse 14, Just as I determined to punish you in the past, when your fathers provoked me to wrath, says the Lord of hosts, 
and I would not relent. That means I did not change my mind. You were punished. So again, in these days, this is the 11th pro uh, promise, 11. So again, in these days, I am determined to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. You see, Jerusalem is the city where the temple is. And then to Judah, the rest of the cities around. Do not fear. I have already decided. So, whether you do ritual or you don't do ritual, you fast or don't fast, I've already decided. In the past, I determined to punish. In the future, I determined to do good to Jerusalem, to the house of Judah. Do not fear. And that is God's commitment to Israel. And verse 16, God added some more. Okay? Now, let me remind you, you also have your part to play. You also have your part to play. These are the things you shall do. So, all these blessings are conditional. Now, for, for Israel, God promised them material blessings. The land, the fruits, and, and the harvest, and so on. Of course, these are all conditional. You must do, then you will get. For the church, did God promise us material blessing? You will get two condos, <laughs> three cars, five beds. You know. No, He promised us spiritual blessings. You go and read the, 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 the epistles of Paul. Promise us spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. Amen. And that is more valuable. Yes. Spiritual blessing. So all this um, prosperity preachers, belly evangelists, you, know, you donate a dollar, you get back two dollars, and then they have rings around here, and rings hanging around their neck, and then drive with all the limousines, and then they come and preach Christ. And one, one, uh, re I think a few months ago, this preacher was challenging his congregation. He needs a third plane, yeah. uh, yeah. and they're preaching Christ. So you see, would my Jesus come in the seven six seven or he comes? <laughs> God did promise us all this. The church, I'm talking about the church. He promised us spiritual blessings. Yes. So anyway, for the people of Israel, these are the things you should do, you shall do, conditional. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. You notice, uh, God has always been so concerned about their love for their neighbors. That means they are always fighting. Uh. They, they are not exactly the easiest to, to, to dwell with. So God is addressing them at their problem. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates. Where, where the elders they sit at the gates of the city and they are supposed to exercise justice, truth. Apparently, some did not. So give judgment in your gates for truth, for justice and peace. Let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor. We look at Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23, Wisdom from God. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. So, don't guard this up. This is more important. Because out of, out of the heart and the mouth speaker, and out of it, the issues of life will spring forth. That's why this Cantonese say, black heart. <laughs> it all starts with the heart. So, let none of you, verse 17. So, how many promises have I given to you? Eleven. Eleven. Okay, good. Okay, so now verse 17. Let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor. 
and do not love a false oath. For all these are things that I hate, says the Lord. And God is very clear what He loves and what He hates. Verse 18, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth month, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be joy and gladness and cheerful feasts for the house of Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. It suddenly got so many more days. Uh, I thought, no, months. Uh, I thought only fifth month seven. and seventh. Uh, fifth month was when uh, the uh, temple was destroyed by Babylon. Then the seventh month was when the governor, Jedaliah, was assassinated. It got fourth and got tenth. Uh. So seven. what are they? And these people have been fasting. So God has been saying, I mean, you say you only do, but I know you all do four. And you're doing weeping. But God is saying, now celebrate with joy. You see, He turned it around. Remember these days with joy, not weeping and fasting. So what is what happened on the fourth month? Jeremiah 52 verse 6. Jeremiah 52 verse 6 This is the fall of Jerusalem Jeremiah 52 verse 6 By the fourth month On the ninth day of the month The famine had become so severe in the city of Jerusalem That there was no food For the people of the land Why? Why was there no food? Because, because the enemies were surrounding the city, you remember? And they blocked the people from going out and anyone from coming in. They were starving the city. So, what, what we have here is verse 6, it was surrounded. Then we jump to verse 12. Now in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. That is all the houses of the great. He burned with fire. So this is the what fifth month. This was when the city fell. Remember, we started in the fifth month, the city fell. Then the seventh month, there was Jedaliah assassinated. We already read that one. And then, what about the tenth month? The tenth month, let's look at the... Uh, let me see. Uh, 52 verse 4. Ah, okay, Jeremiah 52 verse 4 Now it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign In the tenth month On the tenth day of the month That Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon And all his army came against Jerusalem And they camped against it And they built a siege against it all around So if you look at the sequence, uh, you look at the sequence, actually, the 10 month should come first. In the 10 month, in the 10 month uh, of the year, the Babylonians came and besieged the thing, the city, the 10 month. And then, 11 month, 12 month, first month, second month, of the new year, uh, third month, fourth month, then, they breached the wall. That is in verse 6. By the fourth month, verse 6, huh? by the fourth month on the ninth day of the month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food. Then the city was broken through, and all the men of war fled and went out of the city at night, and so on. So, 
In the fourth month, breach. In the fifth month, destroy. You understand? That is the sequence. So the 10 month of the year before, it was besieged. Then, fourth month, they breached the wall. Fifth month, they really went in, destroyed the city. And then, the seventh month, they assassinated Jedaliah. Okay, so all this are meant to be bad memories. So they fasted and they, they wept. But God gave them feast days, not fast days. So, the 12th promise, there shall be feast days. They shall, they, they, they what? shall be joy and gladness and cheerful feast. There shall be joy and gladness for the house of Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. God did not say, therefore, Wait and fast. No, he said, love, truth, and peace. And that means, by loving your neighbor, loving your neighbor, speak the truth, because they seem to be always telling lies. Yeah? And always bickering with their neighbor. So God said, peace and truth with your neighbor. And there shall be joy and gladness. So, there shall be joyful feast days in the future. That is the 12th promise. Now we come to verse 20. Thus says the Lord of hosts, People shall, shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. You know what's the 13th promise? That the blessing shall extend to beyond Israel. The blessing shall extend to beyond Israel because peoples, as that means all nations shall yet come, not yet come, but in the future they will come. Shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. And this last part is beautiful. That is God's desire that through Israel all the nations shall be blessed. The inhabitants of one city shall, shall go to another, saying, Let us continue to go and pray before the Lord. And seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. So, you see the people of one city telling the people of another city, Hey, let's go. Let's go. Let's go to uh, uh, the house of the Lord. Go before Him and seek Him. And I myself will go also. Yes. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. All will congregate towards Jerusalem, which is, will, which is going to be the political and religious capital of the world. So, but if you want to go there before then then you go on Israel trip now <laughs> now you wait for that one okay verse 23 thus says have I given you the 13 promises yes. 13 huh? thus says the Lord of hosts verse 23 in those days that is the millennium in those days then men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, say, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. They are telling the Jew, Gentiles are grabbing a Jew and say, hey, let us go with you. Take us, you know, take us with you. Now, many nations are not friends of Israel. They wouldn't want to be associated with the Jew. They don't want to go to Israel. But in that day, hey, let us go. For we have heard that God is with you. And that is God's plan and desire from the beginning. That through Israel, the world will come to Him. 
But before we end, why 10 men? Why 10 men? If you go and study numbers and so on, 10 men, it's, it represents a complete, yeah, a complete group. So 10. In, in, in short, it means that everyone, everyone, 10 men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve. Wow, that means they're really eager to go now. Eager to go. Grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man. Then grab one now. Terrible. Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Indeed, we know you are with us. You are in us. You go before us. You go with us. You are over us, you are around us, you are inside us, you are up, holding us with your righteous right hand. Lord, we are so blessed. I just pray that from the lessons learned today, that we be right with you in relationship. Yes. Because if we are right with you, the ritual is right. Yes, Lord. Let us not be hypocrites. Yes, Lord. Let us... Uh, continue to build our relationship before you in truth and in righteousness. Yes, Lord. That Lord, we look forward to the day when we shall see you face to face yes. and be with you forever and ever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.